Awesome. Hey, welcome to the house of God. We're glad to have you here at Pursuit on this Sunday morning. Somebody informed me that it is in fact the month of June. You wouldn't know that by looking outside, but anyways, welcome to the Northwest. We're glad to have you and we hope we can keep you at least for a little while. Hey, as, uh, as was already mentioned, but just let me put it again on your radar tonight at 6 p.m., uh, we're having our next Seattle preview service at the Ballard Elks Lodge. Uh, the address is provided for you there right on the screen. Tonight is going to be a special uh, service. We're going to anoint with oil every single person who is there and pray for them as we are contending and believing for a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost on this Pentecost Sunday. And so I would encourage you to be there. Child care is provided, and uh, we'd love to have you join us for this special event. As many of you know, one of the ministries that I'm involved with here in Snohomish is the billboard ministry, and uh, some of you have seen, uh, some of you have seen our billboards, but we got a new one that's coming out here in the next week, and we wanted to give you a little preview first. Try Jesus. <clears throat> if you don't like him, the devil will take you back. So anyways, now it's only funny because it's true, but uh, we just... You know, we got families in this church who are here as a result of seeing a billboard and thinking to themselves, there is no way I have got to check out a church who would put up that type of billboard. So anyways, <laughs> it's one of the special ministries that God has given me in this season. And be on the lookout. That's going to be up by the airport here pretty soon. Hey, this morning I'm going to share with you out of the book of Exodus. <clears throat> and uh, in doing so, we're going to look at chapter 33 together. You know, I want to share with you an experience that Moses has with God that I think reveals the heart of God for his people even today. Even though Exodus is in the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, it still has these applicable principles that you and I follow even in this modern era. Because we serve the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when I'm reading the Old Testament, I'm reading it through the lens of the New Testament but I'm also understanding that God is faithful to his promises. They are yes and amen. He is the God who changes not. And oftentimes what is hidden in these stories, these narratives that we see all throughout the Old Testament, but especially in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, is the expression of God's heart, God's character, and God's nature for his people. And in Exodus 33, Moses is having a conversation with God that will change everything about Moses' future. Moses, by every term, is a complicated figure. He was born during a time where there was an edict in Egypt to kill all of the firstborn male children. So his mom, because she was a woman of faith, took Moses, put him in a basket, sent him down the river. And due to God's providence, it just so happened that Pharaoh's daughter found baby Moses, adopted him, and raised him as her own. The Bible says that even though Moses was raised in Pharaoh's household, he knew that he was not a son of Pharaoh. And the Hebrew children had been in Egyptian bondage now for close to 400 years. The Bible records that one day Moses as a young man saw an Egyptian taskmaster abusing a Hebrew slave. And something rose up in Moses. He intervened, and in doing so, he actually contributed to the death of this Egyptian taskmaster. And as a result of that activity, he fled to the wilderness, where he would live the next 40 years of his life working for his father-in-law. And if that wasn't bad enough, his job was taking care of sheep. He was on the backside of the wilderness, guaranteed he thought his best days were behind him, hiding out in a place where it was too far for anybody to chase him. Hopefully, everybody would forget about his last mistake. And in the fullness of time, God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. And God spoke to Moses, and he said, I know you're trying to run from Egypt, but I'm sending you back to Egypt. This time, not as a victim, but instead as my deliverer for the Hebrew children. Moses marches back to Egypt. God performs 10 signs and wonders through Moses to Pharaoh. Finally, Pharaoh agrees to let the people go, and Moses begins what I call the world's worst camping trip with the world's worst people. <laughs> and for the next 40 years of his life, Moses will oversee 3 million Hebrew children in the wilderness. And from day one, they complain about 
everything. In fact, one of the earliest rebellions that the Hebrew children lead against Moses is a complaint over food. Apparently, it wasn't good enough that God caused manna to rain from heaven. They wanted onions from Egypt. These are the people that God chose to save from Egypt. And Moses is their deliverer. And in Exodus 33, Moses has just received the Ten Commandments from the Lord. Written by God's hand on stone tablets. Moses is so excited. I've received the law of God. It's this supernatural event. This is the law that's going to instruct us in the way that we should go. And he comes down the mountain, and what does he find? This rebellious people worshiping the false gods of Egypt. He pulls Caleb and Aaron aside and he goes, what are you doing? And here's their great excuse. Well, we don't know. The people just took off their golden jewelry and threw it in a fire and out popped a golden calf. Don't look at us. (laughs) Moses is so upset, he breaks the stone tablets. And he decides that he is going to go into the tent of meeting, which was a tent that they set up everywhere that they went in the wilderness. And that tent held the presence of God. Now Moses is upset. He doesn't know what else to do. He's questioning his entire future. He is angry at God's people. And Moses goes into the tent of meeting and he has a conversation with the Most High God that will change everything about him. And that conversation is the one that I'll read to you this morning. Starting in Exodus 33, the Bible says, Then Moses said to the Lord, You have said to me, bring up the people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have found grace in my sight. Now therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, that I may find grace, and that you would consider that this nation is your people. And God responds to Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses asked this question, who will you send with me? 11 years ago, I was 25 years old, working full time as a legislative aide for the House of Representatives in the city of Olympia. I'll never forget the day that I got a call from a pastor named Joe Featon, who was the lead pastor at Cedar Park Assembly of God. And I answered the phone and he said, Russell, I have one question for you. What do you want to do when you grow up? I thought, I told him, I said, I thought I was grown up. He said, let me ask you again, Russell, what do you want to do when you grow up? I said, well, Pastor Joe, Lord has opened a door for me in politics. This is what I intend to do for the rest of my life. At that point, Marie and I had plans to eventually end up on the East Coast to work for the U.S. House of Representatives out in Washington, D.C. And finally, Joe asked me again, what do you want to do when you grow up? I said, well, Joe, why don't you tell me? Because it sounds like you've got something in mind. (laughs) He said, Russell, I want to offer you an illustrious job. I want you to come on as my part-time, interim, young adult pastor. At that time, I was living in Olympia. My wife, Maria, was living in Everett. I would work Monday through Friday. I would come home on the weekends, so exhausted, barely dragged myself to church anyways. And I was thinking to myself, I don't know how I can fit one more thing on my plate. But you know when God puts a yes in your heart, it doesn't always make sense. But it's something that you can't get away from. I tried to turn down the job. I tried to run. I tried to think of the 17 practical reasons for why this couldn't work, but I couldn't get away from the yes that God had placed in my heart. I will never forget our first service. I showed up, it was me, it was my wife, and it was three other people. You know, in moments like that, the only verses that you can think of is where two or three are gathered, there he is in our midst. (laughs) I was so embarrassed, depressed. On the way home, I told Maria, I said, surely God has made a mistake and so have we, so let's back out now. But my wife told me, she said, just hang on and see what God does.
That's a word for some of you this morning. You ought to hang on and see what God does. I want to give up. I want to run from this thing. I want to turn back on my faith. I want to leave this marriage. I want to end this church. I want to run away. I want to go back to my old life. Just hang on and see what God does. See, the Lord spoke to me and said, if you will begin to gather young people to pray, fast, and worship, I will pour out my spirit in a way that marks the region. And so that's what we did. First, it was in my living room, and then it was in a small cafe in the back of a church, and then it was in the fellowship room that was slightly bigger, and somehow we ended up in a mausoleum in the church parking lot. And over the next three and a half years, we saw thousands of students come through our services and experience the power of Jesus Christ in ways that they had never had before. And friend, that was the beginning of my journey with God's presence. We baptized kids, we cast out demons, we healed the sick, we preached the gospel, we saw a genuine revival in a high school and in a church that is still impacting lives today. And you might not know this, but many of the employees who work for me today were just high school students who encountered God on the floor of a church cafe 11 years ago. And at the ripe old age of 28, I decided it was time to plant a church. I was just a scared to death 28 year old with a newborn baby who just quit the only ministry job I ever had. But here's what I've found, the most miserable you will ever be is when you hear the voice of God and then allow fear to dictate your response. And isn't that what faith is? Being scared to death and doing it anyways. And here was my request, God, if you will send your spirit, I will seek your face in a living room, I will seek your face in a barn, I will seek your face in a cafe, if you will send your spirit, I will never allow the size of the crowd, or the amount of the paycheck, or the attendees in the room to dictate my passion. God, if you will send your spirit, I will seek your face. And for the past eight years, I have done the only thing I know how to do, which is inspire people to pursue Jesus, who is so much more more worthy than we have ever dared to imagine. It was just a classroom, but God turned those cement floors into holy places of encounter. It was just a funeral home, but God made those walls sing again with new life. It was just a barn, but God has a good history of starting significant things in insignificant places. And friend, this is just a former department store in the middle of Snohomish. But God has sent his presence and that is all that is needed to take the common and to make it special. And over the last year, we've had the privilege of baptizing close to a thousand folks. I've seen Mormons born again. I've seen atheists born again. I've seen Jehovah's Witnesses born again. I've seen kids filled with the Spirit of God and prophecy. I've seen marriages come back together. I've seen bodies healed. I've seen minds renewed. I've seen folks who are homeless alcoholics who are now on our serve team living in houses for the first time in their adult lives. I have seen it, I have seen it, and we are continuing to see it. If we will seek His face, God will send His presence and that is the only thing that matters but didn't start last week with a bright idea it started in a living room that nobody cared about in a young adult ministry that was on its last legs it started with an insecure scared to death 25 year old just trying to figure out what it would look like to give his life to God and God took that simple obedience and he has used it to make a way where there seemed to be no way and friend I am here to tell you this morning do not despise the day of small beginnings no you might be on your developmental journey and you feel like I've only been 30 days sober I've only been 45 days clean I'm only two weeks into this new relationship I'm only two months into this new marriage I'm just trying to figure out how to raise my kids and do it right do not give up on the land that God has given you for your sacrifice now will pay dividends for the next generation 
Now watch. See, the presence of God or the Holy Spirit is not some sort of mythical force. It's not goosebumps on a Sunday. It's not good thoughts or vibes or vibrations. The Holy Spirit is a person. In fact, the Holy Spirit is God. We believe in one God made manifest in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Bible says he is the helper, the comforter, the teacher, the anointer. The Bible says that he is the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He is the baptizer. He is the one who intercedes for us, encourages us, seals us, convicts us, and establishes us. The Holy Spirit can be grieved, he can be quenched, he can be ignored, or he can be welcomed. And this is a church that welcomes the ministry of God's Spirit, for without him we can do nothing. On Friday morning there was a pretty severe thunderstorm in Snohomish County. There happened to be a lightning strike in my neighborhood at about 6.30 a.m. I happened to be driving in my neighborhood at the time and I saw a tree that had been split in half by this lightning strike still smoldering. As neighbors came out with their cell phones to record videos, with their mouths hung open waiting for emergency crews to get there. And I begin to think about that lightning strike in the context of what God does to believers by virtue of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what causes Christians to be set ablaze. It is the demonstration of power that no man can harness or manufacture. It is the transfer of God's authority and power from above to below. It is that which finds the most available person and endues them with power from on high. Friend, it is a forceful disruption of the ordinary that forever marks your life from that moment forward. When the Spirit fell on Pentecost, it was a lightning strike in Jerusalem that echoed in the region. When the Spirit fell on the Gentiles in Acts 10, it was a lightning strike in Caesarea that echoed in the nations. When the Spirit falls in your family, it's a lightning strike for the next generation. When the Spirit falls on a church, it is a lightning strike into eternity. Moses asks, who will you send with me? And God responds, I will send my presence. I will send my spirit. I will send the one who will cause you to experience in your life the one that you know in your head. I have found myself asking God that same question in this season. Who will you send with me? Who will you send with me to Seattle? Who will you send with me to the next city, the next campus, the next school, the next location? And the answer is always the same. I am sending my presence and it is the one thing that never leaves. And here is what I've found. People will leave. Some because you are too conservative and others because you aren't conservative enough. Some because you don't pay enough attention to their pet issue and others because you pay too much attention to their sin issue. Some because you are too wild and others because you aren't wild enough, but no one has cared for me like Jesus. And as long as he remains, so will we. And that's why Jesus says in John 14, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. He will help you and he will be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. No, the world cannot accept him because they neither see him nor do they know him, but you know him. For he lives with you and he will not leave you. For I will not leave you as orphans and I will come to you. See friend, the Holy Spirit takes head knowledge and turns it into street smarts. The Holy Spirit takes your private witness and makes it a public witness. The Holy Spirit takes a written text and makes it a living text. The Holy Spirit is the person who animates your life and causes you to look like Christ. Here's the problem. We have made the Holy Spirit weird. Or we have so badly defined who he is that many Christians want nothing to do with him. Yes, it's true. The Holy Spirit will make you shake, rattle, and roll. But he'll also make you stand up, apologize, be humble, serve, tithe, and grow up. It is not either or, it is both and. I want you to notice three things that God tells Moses in these short verses. Number one, he tells Moses, you have found grace 
in my sight. Hear me. Did you know this morning that his presence is not a reflection of your performance? It is a reflection of his grace. You can stop telling people you don't deserve it. We already know that. In fact, it's the one thing that we all have in common this morning. We don't deserve it. But grace is not about what you deserve. It's about the sovereign power of a greater authority to bestow something on your life regardless of your past. Grace is the spontaneous, unmerited gift of divine favor in the life of an individual. It is God's divine influence operating in individuals for their regeneration, for their sanctification, and friend, for their glorification. Here's how God thinks about you today. Zephaniah 3, the Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you. He will rejoice over you with singing. Psalms 18, he will bring you out into a broad place for he has rescued you because he has delighted in you. Isaiah 62, the nations will see your vindication. You will be called by a new name. You will have a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of God. No longer will they call you deserted or desolate for the Lord takes delight in you. Psalms 149, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Isaiah 42, behold my servant who I am uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. Hear me. Some of you have grown up in theological environments that have convinced you God is angry. That he barely tolerates you at best that you're lucky he hasn't struck you dead for all of your mistakes, that you deserve sickness and punishment as your portion, that God views you as a distraction or a disappointment. No, friend, the God you serve is like the father of the prodigal son. He is the one who runs to you in the middle of your mess, throws you a party when you come back home, gives you an inheritance that is extravagant, and announces to the entire community that the one who was dead is now alive again. You got to change what comes to your mind when you think about God. No, he is not mad at you. He is madly in love with you. And I want you to see this, this is an important distinction. In the Old Testament, you found grace. But in the New Testament, grace found you. Watch number two, God says to Moses, my presence will go with you. The first time that Moses encounters God at a burning bush is in Exodus three, and Moses asked the question, who am I? 30 chapters later in Exodus 33, Moses asked the question, who are you? And God responds, I am the one whose presence will go with you. Moses doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't know how long it's going to take. He doesn't know how many more rebellions he will have to squash. He doesn't know who will help him lead. He doesn't know how the people will eat. And so he gets alone with God in a tent. And instead of God answering any of Moses' questions, he simply says, my presence will go with you. And Moses responds, that's enough. And friend, until that's enough, nothing else will be Can I tell you how terrifying it is at times to lead a church? Where are we going? How are we going to get there? What are we going to get another property so we don't have to do 43 services on a Sunday morning? (laughs) Who's who's God going to send? Where are the finances going to come from? Where are the volunteers going to come from? And every time I find myself on my knees at this altar, crying out to God for answers, he says, Russell, you are asking for things that you think you need, but that you don't actually need. For in my presence, there is fullness. And that is the promise that I have made to you. My presence will go with you. See, we want answers. But what God wants is nearness. In the Old Testament, God's presence went with you. But in the New Testament, God's presence lives in you. Watch, you got to see this today. Moses experienced God to a lesser degree 
because Moses lived during a lesser covenant. I think when we read Exodus 33, it's easy to think, man, what would it have been like to be in the tent with Moses? He saw the one who led them with a fire by day and a cloud by night. What would it have been like to be in that tent, to see God's glory, to see God's presence? I can't even imagine how incredible that would be. And you know who answers that question for us? Paul. He says this in 2 Corinthians, we are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But whenever, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is lifted. And we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of our God. Which means this, I am not trying to live up to the encounter that Moses had, for I don't serve the God who leads with a fire from above. I serve the one who leads with fire from within. I don't serve the God who rests on my life in temporary ways for temporary activities. I serve the God who has made me his dwelling place. What Moses longed for, we live in, friend. He was the shadow. You are the fulfillment. We've got it backwards. We've got it backwards. We are not longing for what Moses had. Moses was longing for what you and I have today because now we see him face to face and it's not passing away. And that's why Moses had to veil his face when he came down the mountain because the glory that was on Moses' life was fading away because it was a temporary expression. It was a shadow of what God intended to do in the new covenant by making you and I a temple of the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine for 4,000 years in Old Testament history, the patriarchs of our faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Caleb, Aaron, others who were longing for the day when God would dwell with his people without interruption. Friend, that is the day that you and I live in. And that's why I say there's never been a better time to be alive because you live in the fullness of what former generations simply longed for, unbroken relationship with God. And number three, God tells Moses, I will give you rest. For 40 years, Moses hid from God. For 40 years, Moses hid from Pharaoh after killing an Egyptian taskmaster. Moses worked for his father-in-law, taking care of sheep. He worked in a lonely desert, taking care of animals who would never question his past. They would never magnify his failures. They would never bring up his identity. Moses was as far from prominence and significance as you could ever imagine. And that's right where the God of the universe found him. Hear me today. You don't have to run anymore. You don't have to run from your mistakes. You don't have to run from your past or your fears. You can find rest in Jesus because it's in his presence that you are made whole. And it's only the rest that Jesus provides that can motivate the type of work ethic needed to transform this region. We are not working to earn his rest. We are working from a place of already being at rest because we know that it is not our performance that earns favor from God. It is not our following of the law that earns his presence. We don't have a transactional relationship with him. Jesus has paid the debt and has made you alive by placing his Holy Spirit inside the temple of your heart. It's the best news that there's ever been. What animal sacrifices couldn't accomplish, the father accomplished through the death of his son. We are not trying to buy more time to put off God's judgment. We are not trying to earn his favor or find his grace. It has found us. And today we live in that full relationship with a God who is so much better than we've ever given him credit for. The Bible says Moses turned to God. He said, if your presence does not go with us, do not even bring us up from here. 
For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. Watch what Moses is saying. I'd rather stay in the wilderness with your presence than go to the promised land without it. Come on, let me say it for your life today. I'd rather stay single with your presence than be unequally yoked without your presence. I'd rather make minimum wage with your presence than make six figures, lose my integrity, and be without your presence. I'd rather serve God as a doorkeeper and experience his presence than have all the accolades of culture and miss out on this moment. We are people who have simply said, God, we will not move until you move. God, we will not go until you go. Where your presence rests, we will rest. Where your presence stays, we will stay. We are not doing this without you because we are not building a a church to magnify us we are building a church to magnify him and I have heard the voice of God in this season and he says the same presence that you had in that church cafe the same presence you had in that department store it's waiting for you in Seattle so rise up and take the land and the same glory that you've seen in other places you're gonna see there it's his presence that goes before us and it makes a way where there seems to be no way. Moses asked the question, how will people know? What will distinguish us from all of the other folks on the earth? What will be the thing that sets us apart? And God responds, it will be that you have found grace and an outpouring of my presence is what followed. Here's what I wanna be known for in the Northwest, that we are a presence driven church that we are gathering the people of God in the house of God to move the heart of God we are here to glorify and magnify him the church isn't built around our needs the church isn't built around our preferences or our proclivities the church is built to honor and magnify the one who is worthy. And when we gather with that express purpose, he pours out his presence without measure. Guys, that's what we have been seeing over the last year. The church has grown 4X. We can't add services fast enough. People are getting their lives wrecked at these altars week after week after week. God is opening doors all across this region. We've got folks asking us to start campuses in cities I've never even heard of we are seeing the goodness of God pass right in front of us and it's not reflective of our performance or our giftedness it is reflective of a good God who delights in his children who has poured out more than we could ever possibly contain you are seeing the goodness of God in the land of the living and I'm here to tell you this is what church should feel like this is what you were built for this is what you were meant for this this is who we really are. I'm out of time, let me pray for you. Father, now in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you that you have sent the advocate to dwell inside of us. God, I pray that your spirit would baptize us in fresh power and courage to be everything that you have asked us to be. God, I pray that we would be known as a peculiar people in the Northwest who have set our gaze on Jesus and will not be moved. God, I thank you for what you're doing all across this region. And God, we pray on this Pentecost Sunday for a fresh outpouring of your wind and your fire on this community. God, we know it's not by our might. We confess it is not by our strength but it is by your spirit alone. And so we're saying, God, would you build this church? God, would you come and receive your glory and honor? And would the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering in Snohomish and beyond? God, do what only you can do. And if you will be our God, we will be your people. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, all God's people said amen. amen. And amen. Friend, if you're here today and you'd like prayer before you leave, I want to invite you to these altars. I want to add my faith to yours to see God do a miracle in your life. If not, God bless. We're going to be back at it in Seattle, 6 p.m. tonight. 
a special anointing service for everyone who comes. Invite a friend. We'd love to see you in Seattle. God bless. We'll see you soon.